Hey guys, my name is Sam Cora and I'm the director of the Green Coffee Program here at Honor Coffee. I am so pleased to be able to bring you this special release coffee box showcasing three amazing innovations in processing from three fantastic coffee producers that I had the pleasure of visiting in March this year. This box set not only is about celebrating innovation and amazing coffees, but it's also about celebrating Honor's ongoing direct connection to origin. Though we proudly celebrate our partnership with sister company Project Origin, did you know that each year Honor sources around 50% of their reserve lots directly? These are relationships that are tended to by the likes of myself, Hugh and Sasha. These direct relationships span over several countries throughout Latin America, South America, Africa, and Asia. One country that I am personally particularly strongly connected to is Panama. I have to say, in the last few years, I am so privileged to be able to visit directly our partners here on a regular basis and to be able to taste and select coffees with them. Since 2016, Honor's direct partnerships in Panama have grown annually from strength to strength. Today, I'm proud to say that we offer around 10 to 12 amazing Panama producers annually throughout our monthly rotations, special releases, and even in competitions. The joy for me is not only just being able to offer a wide selection of these amazing coffees to our customers, but also to be able to feel privileged yearly to be welcomed into these people's homes in order for me to gain a deeper connection to the places in which these coffees grow. Each year, my respect grows for these producers and the challenges that they face in every harvest. And it allows me to better understand the landscapes of each of their farms. I'm inspired yearly by the innovations that they bring and captivated by the intricacies of each of the details in their processes. What I appreciate the most is the opportunity to be able to share feedback face to face directly with these producers who make the copies that we love possible. Because to me, cup quality is only one aspect. What makes these copies special yearly largely relies on communications and the strength of our direct relationships. Guys, you have some amazing coffees to enjoy this evening. I wish you a fantastic event. So yeah, super lucky to have Sam. Um, he is living overseas now, but it gets him closer to Origin so he can visit more. He does a lot of um, sourcing for our rotation. So um, super, super handy with his skill set um, and his longer term understanding uh, with you know competitions and you know, being previously head roaster and spending a lot of time with you know Sasha and Project Origin team, he's able to connect um, with Danny, who then connects with me, so it sort of carries through. So, awesome! Uh, can we jump onto the next slide, uh, please? Fantastic! So, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Danny. If you haven't met me, I'm the head roaster at Honor Coffee, and yes, like we heard, we got three amazing coffees to try today. Uh, that Sam sourced over in Panama. We also thought this would be a really great opportunity for you to give you guys a bit of a peek behind the curtain about what we do uh, down in Fish Week in Canberra in the warehouse with our roasting and recipe development program. What you can see up here is what I'm calling a balance profile for different coffees. So here's the three different coffees that we're going to be working with today. We have a really delicious slot from uh, Don Benji Lost Origin. And we have a coffee from uh, Abu uh, Coffees, and we have the Me Finkita coffee. Uh, we're going to go into a lot more detail with these different lots uh, over the next sort of hour or so. But I really wanted to draw your attention to these little graphs that I've uh, put together. When we cup coffees, uh, there's obviously a lot of complexity to them. They have different uh, profiles, different flavor profiles, and they also have different levels of balance. I've highlighted here three of the most important ones for today uh, because I thought it would be a really good example uh, to show you what I'm doing in the roasting process. So when we're cupping these uh, different lots, I'm looking at these different uh, elements in the coffee 
and looking at how I can manipulate them and change them so that we can, I guess, go into more depth on the brewing and recipe development side. So I want to take the best of what each of these coffees has to offer, balance everything out a little bit so that Kelly can do the best work in developing the recipes. Uh, we're, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how I've attacked the roasting for each of these coffees as we go through and explore them and how that influences what Kelly does. So now we're going to jump over the next slide and introduce our first coffee, which is uh, the Dombeji Lost Origin lot. Hello everyone, my name is Franz from Lost Origin Coffee Labs. We are a coffee processing facility located in Panama City. After 10 years of experience with craft brewing, we decided we wanted to apply our know-how of fermentation and processing into the world of specialty coffee. When we started Lost Origin, we knew we wanted to make some profiles in which we gave ourselves more freedom from traditional norms, where we could play with unique microorganisms to produce flavor profiles that are not common in coffee. This is one of those profiles. Today I'm here to share with you a unique lot that we created for Ana Coffee. Lot 008-011 is a deep old geisha from Finca Lombenji, located in Bajomono Boquete at over 1500 meters above sea level. This lot was inoculated with a unique strain of yeast, Lunar Crush Lager from Omega Labs. The yeast was developed in order to enhance thiols through biotransformation in beer. Thiols are highly aroma-active compounds that produce fruity profiles in beer. With temperature set at 12 degrees Celsius, the deep oak coffee was placed into our custom-made fermentation vessels, where it was spent seven days. After seven days in the tank, the coffee was set out to dry in our controlled indoor drying rooms, where it was spent 28 days at a constant temperature of 18 degrees Celsius and an average relative humidity of 45%. The goal with this lot was to create a coffee that has a clean, fruity profile. Personally, this profile reminds me of New Zealand Nelson Sabine hops, which have an elegant white grape and gooseberry profile. We hope you enjoy this lot that Sam personally selected for Ona. Awesome. So, really, really exciting coffee to start with. What's really special about this lot is how there's, I guess, a separation between uh, the team that are growing and uh, farming the coffee. So that's the team at uh, Don Benji. And then we have the team at Lost Origin, which are handling the processing and fermentation of this coffee. So even at that farm level, we've got a collaboration going on. From there, the reason why I wanted to start with this coffee is because, as you can see on the little balance profile on the left, we're looking pretty balanced already. This is such a clean, delicious coffee that I really didn't need to do too much to it in terms of how we're going to manipulate things. So with that in mind, the approach that I've taken is I wanted to keep a nice fast roast profile. We've kept the roast time at around seven and a half minutes. This is going to maintain the maximum amount of aroma and flavor uh, that's inherent in that coffee already. And then I just wanted to do a little bit of work to bring down that acidity slightly. I've taken the development of this coffee, which is that time that we spend after the first crack, taken that out to 15% of the total roast, which is just going to bring that acidity down slightly. And in order to make sure that we don't over caramelize those natural flavors, all those fantastic things that we are getting from that processing, I've come into first crack with quite a gentle amount of heat. So we're increasing around three degrees every 30 seconds in that last part of the roast. Now that seems like a lot of technical talk, but my main goal here was just to round out that acidity and keep as much natural characteristics of the coffee as possible, which is going to allow Kelly to develop that recipe and get the most out of this coffee. So from there, I'm going to hand over to him and he can uh, explain to you how we've attacked the brewing of this coffee. All right, so next slide. Um, so we can see here, yeah, Danny's been relatively gentle uh, with this coffee. When you start with a product that is already sitting pretty close to quite balanced, you're not having to do so much roast manipulation in order to try and balance that acid. Um, but we also know that this coffee, for example, is, is going to be very clean. We know things have been controlled um, a lot in processing, as we can see. Um, we'll maybe hold off the music for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> no. it, it works though, which is good. Um, so we can see, yeah, we've, we've got that good texture. 
which is definitely a part of, um, of our good fermentation um, in the coffee. So this is a stretched out fermentation. It is low temperature, low, uh, longer time for a pulp ferment. Um, this is helping us to develop that extra texture in this coffee. So usually a washed geisha, we're not expecting to have that really thicker texture, uh, but he's through really great processing helped that happen. Um, so what we've done with this brew is we've extended the ratio slightly. Uh, so usually we're about one to 15 uh, ratio. So usually roughly 20 grams dose to 300 grams of water added in five stages. We've added uh, an extra five to 10 grams of water um, to that ratio, just stretching it a tiny little bit because this coffee can get pushed. As we saw with Danny, he was going re reasonably gentle into first crack and he's been fast roast time. So where we can kind of push that coffee a little bit harder. Um, and also we know that processing is extremely controlled. Um, so there's not as much bad that we need to hide from, from in a way. So stretching that ratio slightly, uh, we, we weren't really sacrificing texture, which is pretty nice. Uh, we know as well, great acid quality. So if we ferment for extended periods of time without control, the acid quality can tend to possibly turn vinegary. Uh, they can go sour. Uh, we can get that negative in the acid. Uh, but what he's done is gone that low temperature. He's inoculated. You can see everything's been controlled and mixed. Um, in the drying, he's got indoor conditions. So you're not getting really uncontrolled fermentation once you take it out of the tank. So the acid quality remains very refined, beautiful quality. So for that reason, we're, we're more than happy to highlight that. So one of the reasons Danny hasn't you know, put extra roast on this coffee is because we don't necessarily want to break down too much of that acid. Um, we want to just control it a little bit. Uh, now with uh, the brewing, we can push a bit harder. So when we know with brewing, if we increase our temperature, generally we're getting a higher intensity of acid. Yes, you're extracting maybe more sweetness, more, more different characters from that coffee, but generally one of those tendencies that we see with our coffees is higher temperature, higher intensity of acid. Lower temperature, lower intensity of acid. Um, but with this one, we've got a higher brew temp, so we've got 92 degrees. This coffee can be pushed a bit harder. I've got no issues exposing that acid a little bit more. Um, we have played with grind set a little bit to look at trying to get the uh, extraction to a good level. Um, so we're going that kind of 1.35 to 1.4% uh, percent TDS. It's pretty sort of like on the higher end of extraction for, for some of our coffees. Um, but then, yeah, pump that, uh, that temperature to really push the coffee. Uh, we have that really high quality sweetness. Uh, so we've, and we've got a wash coffee, so we can go a slightly finer grind than uh, maybe what we would have done with the natural. Uh, and we're, we're kind of um, concentrating that sweetness a little bit with that uh, slightly finer grind set slightly higher TDS, slightly higher extraction, really um, improve that sort of sweetness development. Uh, two pours of the Paragon. So what we would usually do is dial our coffees in, and then we start to apply different numbers of pours out of the five pours. We might choose maybe just the bloom or two pours or three pours or four pours or five pours. Every coffee is gonna be different. Uh, this coffee, two pours seem to be really nice. It's quite a vibrant coffee. If we were to push more pours over that chilling rock, that vibrancy became a little bit too much. Um, so yeah, two, two pours is where it sat really nicely. Less pours and we weren't getting that crispness and that freshness and that grapey sort of characteristic um, as much. Um, so yeah, we, we can see there like, you know, the acid is a little bit elevated, but for this coffee, it is um, a really pleasant thing. Um, so we'll soon have some coffees coming around. Um, I guess, what you're gonna to see tonight is the three different coffees are approached quite differently at farm level. Danny's approached at the roast level um, in different ways as well. So then basically the way we look at brewing is gonna be responding to what's happened before it. So uh, when we do recipe development, um, Danny will put different roasts on a coffee. We'll be looking at what characteristics were in a cupping bowl. And then we'll go, yeah, we want this character, we want that character, these are the sort of elements that we want to shine. What roast profiles are kind of giving us that? And then we'll uh, start applying brewing that suits the roast profile. Because generally, roast profile and brewing are linked. If you were to start putting extra roast on a coffee, um, or extra end degree or whatever, you're gonna to need to change your brewing to respond to that. It's not about going, uh, I mean, in our opinion, it's not about going, oh, I wanna, lower strength style of brew, and I'm just gonna do that with whatever's in the bag. It's more a, is that coffee suited to that 
sort of strength level. Um, so as an example, this one had, uh, we, we wanted to maintain that acid. Uh, the concentration of a brew, um, so the, the ratio of a brew, we usually respond to the amount of acid in a coffee. So if a coffee's got a higher level of acid retained, like for this one, we've got that really high quality, we've retained that acid with the roast. Um, that means that also that slightly more diluted brew style uh, will work with that slightly higher acid level. Um, if we were to have a lower acid in the coffee, if we stretch out a roast profile, we might go more concentrated ratio with that sort of coffee. It's a similar thing that applies over to espresso. Um, generally for milk coffees, for example, there are longest roast profile. Uh, and in response to that, we're going slightly higher doses, slightly shorter beverage weights, uh, because that quantity of acid will fit that concentration a little bit better. Um, so I always like to sort of liken that to um, if you were to drink straight lemon juice, that's considered very high acid, high concentration. You don't want that, um, you don't want to drink that straight. It's going to be puckering, it's going to be super sour. Um, but if we were to add a certain amount of water to it, that's going to start to become a pleasant thing to drink, right? It's, um, there's a sort of appropriate concentration uh, for those different elements there. So as the cups come around, um, yeah, like have a smell. Uh, this is a, a wash style of coffee. Um, it's not completely washed. Like, I mean, the coffee's come out of the tank. They haven't washed it completely. So you've got some of that mucilage intact. Uh, the reason why you can do that is he can dry in those really low humidity conditions inside and you're not getting so much volatility in what's happening during the drying. Um, so I, I guess like having a smell, you should get some of those caramels on the nose. Um, you're going to see a bit of impact of process, even though the coffee's pulped. So usually like a natural processed coffee has more process influence. This doesn't kind of taste so processed, which is um, going to be quite interesting. Welcome. Welcome to Hacienda Cañas Verdes, where we produce Abu Coffee. Abu Coffee was named to honor the memory of Jose Guillermo Latrell Tedman in order to continue his dream of one day growing specialty coffee in Bukete. The name Abu is short for Abuelo, which his grandchildren used to call him. Abu Coffee is cultivated in the region known as Canas Verde in Bukete. Coffee trees are grown on the slopes of the Volcan Baru National Park in a humid microclimate typical of a tropical forest. Abu Coffee is unique as Jose does not use any mechanical dryer and 100% of his lots are dried on raised African beds exposed to outdoor elements. This is something that is very unusual in modern day Panama. Here, sunlight is crucial throughout the whole process. The farm sees almost uninterrupted daily sun from sunrise to sunset. The coffee starts its journey on the bed at the bottom of the slopes. And when it's around 16% humidity, it's moved to the top part of the farm to slowly dry in the cooler conditions. The lot that you'll be drinking today is called GW78. For several lots this year, Jose has been innovative in the use of recycling. These methods recycle coffee pulp, mucilage, and the yeast and cultures present in the musto of previous fermentations taken place at the farm. For this lot, the cherries were picked and pulped on the same day. The depulp seeds were then placed into a sealed tank with a liquid musto and mucilage of another geisha washed fermentation. The freshly pulped coffee was submerged in this liquid in an anaerobic environment for four days before being moved to African beds and left to dry for 19 days. The results of this process is described in Jose's own words as creating a bouquet of flowers. Cool, so this is the second year we've had the chance to work with Jose's coffees. Uh, absolutely amazing examples of Panama Geisha. This particular lot is, I guess, slightly different to the last uh, coffee. Instead of looking for that more fruity flavor profile, I kind of describe this as a really enhanced washed profile. Uh, you heard Sam talking about how he's using that uh, inoculation uh, of the um, mosto, the mosto <laughs> in the fermentation to really enhance 
uh, that uh, anaerobic fermentation. This gives us a really like more full and more intense washed profile. And you can kind of see that in the balance profile that I've got here. In comparison to that last lost origin lot, you'll notice that we've still got plenty of aroma, but we've also got quite a lot of acid and slightly less texture than the last lot. This meant that I had to change how I was approaching uh, the roasting of this coffee. Now it might seem like I guess uh, a very like, common idea to try and roast all your filter coffees sort of as light as possible and then use brewing to try and balance out uh, everything. Uh, and quite often you see us uh, people pushing high brew temperatures for these dense uh, washed coffees. I really wanted to use roasting as one of the levers to manipulate this to get the best possible balance uh, and give Kelly the best uh, chance to do the work in the uh, brewing stage. So in comparison to the last lot, what I've done to uh, alter this roast is I've slowed down the total roast time. So we put around 15 seconds on the total roast time, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it makes all the difference in the uh, final taste of the brew. You can't actually see it here, but I've come into first crack with more energy than I did with the last roast. This means we're going to caramelize the flavor of the coffee just a little bit. But that's going to be really crucial in bringing down that level of acidity and enhancing the texture in the coffee. I didn't want to push this too far and generate any unpleasant uh, or ashy flavors. So I've counteracted that by reducing the amount of development that we're putting on after first crack down to 13%. Uh, overall, this gives us a much more balanced uh, profile than we see here and really opens up the scope for what Kelly can do with the brewing. Uh, so we'll jump on to the next slide and we can talk about how we've approached this slightly different style of roast. On to the next slide. <laughs> uh, here we are. So um, you're starting to see... You know, we have two very different start structures. So that previous graph, uh, the graph up there, is kind of that representation of cupping bowl. Um, so we look at a coffee in its raw form from a cupping bowl um, as having a specific structure. And then we're wanting to sort of manipulate that a little bit in the roast, as Danny's done. You'll see that he's put that little bit of extra roast degree on it. So he's gone that touch darker. I'm not saying he's gone dark. He's, he's pushed it a little bit darker in sort of filter land. Um, so what we'll start to see is a little bit of a trend on roast to brew interacting with each other. So we kind of think of it as, um, in a way, it's like a little bit of a push-pull sort of situation. So Danny, in this case, has pushed a little bit more on the roast lever, and then we're kind of pulling back on the brewing style in response to that push. So if he was to push hard on roast and I was to push hard on, on brewing like we did with the Lost Origin, uh, we're going to start to bring negatives out in the cup. So it's, a, it's kind of si a simple way in my mind to sort of um, to think about that. So um, roast to combat, to combat that higher acid, that's bringing that acid down a little bit. Uh, but then in this case as well, uh, we're getting that double whammy. I'm brewing at a slightly lower temperature, uh, that 89 degrees, that's three degrees lower, it's quite a lot. Um, so partly you're wanting to do that lower temperature because he's put that extra little bit of roast on it. If I was to hit that high temperature, you're gonna start to bring um, some of the tannin, you might start to bring a little bit of the negative, like maybe you might hit a bit of dryness or whatever. Um, so by roasting a little bit more, you can brew a little bit lower temperature and still really develop that sweetness and develop that texture. Uh, but we get the same also benefit in that, that lower brew temperature brings that slightly lower intensity of acid, um, which is what we're kind of wanting to do. We've done, Danny's gone a little bit on his side to reduce that acid, and then I've gone a little bit on my side with the brewing to reduce that acid again. Um, what we're wanting to do is the idea of bringing a coffee into balance allows us to really taste what its natural characteristics are. So if you think about it, if you taste an espresso that's very out of balance, it's hard to see a lot. I mean, let's just say you get a very citrus driven espresso that's very sour. All you see is that citrus. You're not going to see all those beautiful, you know, textured, sweeter, rounder fruits underneath it. Um, same idea here. When we start to bring that into balance, we're going to really be able to express that florality um, that, um, that they wanted to bring out with the process. Um, so once we're starting to get that little bit of extra roast on it, we're starting to see more sweeter notes. We're starting to see more of those uh, beautiful sort of darker floral notes in this coffee, which are um, yeah, tasting really, really nice today. Um, 
So yeah, there we're, we're sitting there with that acid quantity management, 89 degrees, that lower temperature. Uh, but then also when you have a geisha, with, um, with, it's always got those floral compounds in there. If you put extra roast on it. So and I'm sure you've tasted a, a, a more extreme example is a geisha espresso. You're putting extra roast on those espresso roasts generally. Uh, so geisha has that high acid. And for espresso, you might be roasting it more to try and bring that acid down. But if you keep pushing that roast, you start to push tannin and you start to get that in the back of your palate, palate the tannin and bitterness. And then you find yourself like threading the needle between acid and tannin. Um, so that's an example of what putting that extra roast on a coffee that is floral um, can do for you. Uh, so we need to sort of avoid some of those tannins. So we've gone just a little bit coarser on the grind set, uh, we've gone slightly lower strength compared with the previous coffee. So um, instead of 1.35 to 1.4, we're sitting in the low 1.3s for this coffee, which seems to be where it wants to be in response to that roast profile. Um, and again, the two pour Paragon has worked really well. Um, it's funny, all these coffees ended up two pours. So, um, but that's just one of those things that the last stage for our dial-in, we start applying Paragon brewing and figure out what works. Um, so what's really interesting about the extract chilling part of it is, and it's something that worked for me for espresso um, as well, was when you have a coffee that has a tendency to give you some tannin, uh, you bring more vibrancy in the aroma profile of a coffee and you actually offset some of those tannins as well. So um, I know with you know, my coffee for WBC, it didn't have a lot of vibrancy and that brought a little bit of tannin on the finish. But if you applied enough extract chilling to it, that tannin would disappear and it becomes smoother in the texture as well. So this is one of those things in response to the roast profile. Again, it's that extra little step and that extra little lever that we can push um, to, to manage that. Again, pushing more pores over the, over the ice rock brought out a little bit too much vibrancy because as we said, we've got that higher vibrancy coffee um, in, in vibrancy in the acid perception. But um, just that two pour was softening that tannin structure, making the texture a little bit smoother. Uh, and what you'll see in this coffee is, um, yes, like it is a vibrant coffee. You will still, still get that beautiful acid profile. Uh, it's almost like reminding me of a Kenyan style in its acid. Um, but you will see these beautiful sort of violet, um, these darker floral notes um, in the back and they're gonna be soft and they're gonna be long and, and um, yeah, super, super tasty profile. Um, we we're seeing, what was it? A little bit of like red plum in there as well. Danny, I can't remember with this coffee. Um, this, uh, the boo. We tasted this earlier today and I feel it got more. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's more in that, uh, I guess you get that uh, more plum, you get a little bit of, I guess, those darker um, sort of stone fruit characteristics in there. Um, less I get, you get a little bit of like a caramelized citrus note as well. That's that, I guess, aspect that I was talking about with the, with the roast. We have manipulated that flavor profile just a little bit, but overall this had a big benefit like Kelly was talking about on the overall balance of the coffee. So we've kind of got a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, but yeah, we kind of wanted to push this about and what he wanted out of this lot was that florality is a really beautiful part of this coffee. So yeah, we'll get a bit of the music on that's gonna help to. It's beautiful. Hello everybody. My name is Tessie Hardman. From Panama, we would like to invite you to try the new release of Ona Coffee from Mi Finquita by Radivor Hartman, the Great Reserve Lot 1, Geisha Natural Honey Fermented. Radivor Hartman not only manages some of the best coffee estates in Panama, but he's also well known for being an innovator. Yearly, he pushes the boundaries and strives to always improve the experience he can offer through the various coffee estates he manages. Mi Finquita means my small farm. The Mi Finquita project showcases small farms that rely on the coffee knowledge of Radabor and Tessie Hartman to help process their coffees. The combined 10 hectares of these farms, though separated geographically, are all located around the Los Pozo area in Cherokee province of Panama. For this special lot, Radabor considers the complex nature of what happens in fermentation. To survive, yeast need to feed on a source of sugar. Traditionally, this source of sugar would come from the mucilage of the coffee cherries. 
but Radabaugh believed that in extended fermentation, the consumption of the coffee cherry sugars also started to result in the development of savory and acetic acidity that would often spoil the coffee's profile. He wondered what fermentation could be done that didn't consume any of the coffee cherry sugars. So he started with the cherries, native yeast, and fed that yeast honey that's produced on the farm. Over the next few days, he regularly measures the sugar content, and any time that it would dip, he would add more honey into the fermentation. The result is a stunningly clean and vibrant natural that bursts with almost confectionery-like sugars. It does not have the heavy profile of a coffee that had been fermented for this amount of times, and surprised even Radabor and myself. Three. Hmm. Three. Uh, Absolute hmm. bomb. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is some, this is there's two coffees on the table which are phenomenal. That's the only way I can describe it. This one just jumps out with like abundance of like candy bread fruit. It's whiny, but with a really nice kind of like pleasant, elegant ferment. Uh, I get like a nice candy kind of fruit flavor on the on the palate, strawberry jam, really long and tropical, kind of a buttery sensation to it. It has the intensity, but the elegance is still there, like super polished. Uh, to me, I gave it 92.75. 92? Yeah. From Nifikita Farm, mm -hmm. it's a Geisha natural, but under a honey process. So that means it's not a honey like like that, but because it's a natural process, okay. but using honey in into the process. Mm. Yeah. So adding adding honey to the okay. So that's why they call it honey. Like an actual honey. honey. Like like honey. Kind of cool to capture a moment like yeah. that. Eh? I'm pretty sure that conversation went on for quite a while, <laughs> discussing the, the uh, you know the nuances and details about that process. It's obviously, super exciting and interesting process, and it's also really interesting to hear how producers are looking for different techniques and ways of addressing, I guess, what they see the problems are in their coffees and challenges they're facing during processing. You're talking there about uh, how he's finding through those extended processes, often finding those savory or uh, vinegary styles of acidity and looking at different ways and techniques that they can use to address that in the processing of their coffees. So with that in mind, uh, we see a quite a different balance profile in this coffee as compared to the first two. I guess the main difference here is this is a natural processed coffee. The other two we obviously had a fully washed coffee and also the first one was, I guess, quite a washed profile style of coffee with that uh, lost origin. Yeah, this is a natural processed coffee. The difference in the balance profile, we now have quite a reduced amount of acidity in the cup, but heaps of aroma and heaps of texture. So that gives me, I guess, a lot more scope in what I want to do with the roasting to really enhance those qualities. And what I've done is basically tried to apply as little roasting as I can to retain as much uh, flavor that I can in the coffee and as much of that natural acidity in the coffee as I can. You can see of all the roasts, this is the fastest out of all of them. We're sitting at just seven and, uh, minutes and 25 seconds. I've only put 11% development, so quite a short amount of time after first crack because I'm just looking to apply just enough roasting on this coffee to retain as much as possible. Uh, I've come into first crack at again that low uh, amount of uh, energy, so we're only at three degrees increase per 30 seconds again, just like our first coffee. And overall, this is a super, super light profile. I wanna, yeah, do as little as I can, and that's gonna give uh, Kelly a lot of, uh, I guess, scope to enhance the, this coffee through the brewing. <clears throat> All right, so next slide. So, we can see here, yeah, very, very different coffee. Um, I want to just start off by saying, like, I wouldn't call this coffee infused. Uh, it's, it's definitely, I, I think of an infused coffee as one where you, let's just say you get orange citrus oil, you put that into a tank or spray it over the drying um, cherries or whatever that is, and that might become the dominant flavor. This is definitely not one of those. Um, honey has gone into the tank. Yes, you will get a little bit of honey in the profile, but it's not a dominant profile and you will see the characteristics and uniqueness of the variety, the origin, all that sort of stuff shining through. You will see complexity. Um, so 
that that's where this one um, this one differs in that sort of sense. It does get consumed. So if you were to, um, yeah, it, yeah, and obviously there is going to be imparting just like a little bit of that character there, um, but you won't see it as the sole dominant characteristic. So um, there's a bit of finesse there. Um, it is definitely treading the line, but yeah, I, I definitely think of this as a normal coffee um, that's just been enhanced with what he's got around him. Um, and I, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, so as we can see here, um, it's a little bit opposite to the previous coffee. So Danny, in a way, with roast has pulled and I pushed um, a little bit more with um, the brewing. So lighter roast, slightly lighter roast, less development, less energy coming into first crack, uh, faster roast. It's, it's definitely trying to be as gentle and light and, and everything on this coffee as possible. As we know with natural processed coffees, you put a lot of roast onto it uh, and you're gonna highlight the heavier notes. Uh, we need to boost that vibrancy, boost that acid profile, bring that balance, bring that juiciness. Um, that's one of the things that on the cupping table this coffee really shows in spades. Uh, so what we'll see is uh, in terms of uh, brewing, we've gone higher temperature. So this is a, it's sort of counterproductive um, to the way I would normally approach a natural process coffee and especially anaerobic naturals. I usually go a little bit lower brew temperature um, from the beginning because if you start, uh, so when you start um, fermenting in cherry, drying in cherry, you have those polyphenols, you have those tannin structures from the skin. Some of that does impart into the seed. So you put higher brew temps, you start to be aggressive with naturals and you start to pull some of that tannin and you start to get that rougher texture and things like that. Um, but we've gone lighter roast and I want to boost that juiciness of the acid. So um, this is where um, you'll see at the bottom there, two stage temperature brewing um, comes in. And this is one of those ones that you were seeing Sasha do a Brewer's Cup. Um, previously, Devin's done this at Brewer's Cup. It's a really, really great lever that you can pull with these kinds of coffees. So this coffee was uh, brewed at that higher temperature, more like that 92. If we were to go to the lower temperature, we weren't getting that as much vibrancy and juicy fruit in this coffee as possible. As we've seen, the coffee's had the honey added to the ferment and that's reduced the um, development of that acetic acid, so that vinegar style acid, which can usually be sour. I know if you usually extend out a ferment, let's just say, I'm thinking extended ferments are like five days plus, really sort of six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days sort of thing. You're really starting to push some of that vinegar acid in there. If you really highlight that, you're gonna get sourness, you're gonna get roughness, you're gonna get that peaky acid profile on the brew. Uh, but this one is not like that. We don't have so much of that acetic quality in there. It is a very high quality acid. So we really wanted to highlight that and use that to lift up the lighter notes of the natural process. Make it taste cleaner, make it taste more fruity. Uh, so, but then you have that issue with, if you start pushing high temperatures, on a natural, you could possibly get some of those tannins and the, the bitterness and everything there. Um, so we're kind of like stuck between two sort of approaches there. Usually I'm dropping temperature with naturals to avoid that back palate tannin. But with this one, uh, we're kind of wanting to do both at once. So first three pours at the 92, and then the last two pours are below 85. So that helps you soften that back end we're getting all that vibrancy, that juiciness, some of that tropical fruit. Um, I was getting in this earlier on like a golden kiwi quality. It's like the, the lifted, like more vibrant character, but then you get that softer, smoother sort of back palette. Um, we've also gone slightly coarser grind uh, than the other two because we're with natural. Um, that, that sort of gives us that really nice flavor expression. Um, a similar strength to the Abu, um, that sort of 1.32 to 1.35. Um, and two pours over the Paragon seem to work for all three, so it's not really a lever that we're pulling, uh, but that's bringing more vibrancy and light, lighter notes, which we really wanted to encourage. Um, so yeah, we'll get that music on. This has um, definitely gonna highlight some of those textural elements, that creaminess in the, on the palette. It's got sort of a fuller texture to the other two, but also you'll get that vibrancy, lightness, and that juicy fruit in the middle palette. Um, we get some more coffees coming up over here. Ah. Yeah. We can, we can real. We'll do two passes we'll do on the Two little music. passes on that. <laughs> but this coffee, um, because you ferment in cherry, you know, you have that ability to get, you know, more spectrum, more colors, more different fruity notes. We've had everything from like 
red Powerade in this one. We've had like some of these confectionery red, like um, red jellies. We've had um, yellow tropical fruits. We've had kiwi, we've had pineapple. Um, it's a very complex layered coffee. And you will see a little bit of that honey, but it kind of fits with that geisha profile to give like a floral honey. And I think of it sort of like a manuka honey, um, which is quite an interesting profile. And that sweetness sort of binds everything together and it just makes it such a beautiful profile. Extended ferment, you'll notice it is very clean. It doesn't taste like an extended ferment, really. Usually when I'm thinking extended ferments, I'm thinking cocoa nibs, I'm thinking um, savory stuff like your soybean paste, uh, um, possibly mushrooms if you're pushing it 15 plus days. Um, but you're not getting any of that in this, in this profile. It's all clean. It's almost wash style in its flavor, but it's, it's got that layers and it's got that um, yeah, extra texture and, and fun from the, from the bigger fermentation. So, what's that? The, yeah, go again. We'll have some more coffees coming around soon. But. Yeah, so with the, the music, um, it depends on like the tonality of the music that can highlight texture differently. So we have some of these bass notes in here that are kind of giving us a little bit more of that creaminess. But then it's also got that lively like top notes that's sort of helping that acidity pop in perception as well. Um, so it, it really helps sort of highlight both layers of this coffee because it kind of has multiple there. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you start to just go like say music from the past uh, one, you start to lose that perception of some of the fruit. Um, you start to see more of the floral honey. Yeah. Um, how would I learn more about the same uh, there's, there's a lot of research in like food journals, so they, they do, there's people that do like sensory dinners and things like that. Um, there's a lot of research that's gone into like wine tasting, um, with manipulations of that. Um, they use things like, uh, what's it, the, they measure the electrical energy of your brain when you taste something, you have different parts of your brain lights up, because it's all electrical signals. Uh, so you can actually link so those electrical pulses and those, um, you can actually measure those things and you can link that up with the electrical pulses that come through in music because it is essentially electrical pulses. So you can help the brain to sort of experience certain things that are present in a product by sort of lining those things up. It's similar to that idea of, um, oh, what's it called where you, uh, synesthesia. So you like see a color and you, t uh, you can maybe, you taste something and you see a color. Some people, they're those sort of wires cross in a way and not everyone's brain is sort of designed to work that way. So it's kind of weird with the same coffee, you can change the music from sip to sip and it's sort of like you see it slightly differently. It's not like you're changing the product or manipulating the person so much. You're, you're just kind of going, hey, look over here a bit more or look over there a bit more. Um, so it's not gonna like, totally change the coffee, it's just going to help you experience it um, in a different way. Yeah, a little. We'll yeah, see. I'll go a little bit. So yeah, very different structure, very different style of coffee. I'll brew, I'm brewing one more. If, if there was more than like 15 kilos of it, I would have definitely roasted some for espresso because I think it would have been absolutely delicious, but. Yeah, cool. Uh, I guess I wanted to sort of wrap up by just talking about uh, why it was so, so much fun and it was so uh, engaging to work with these coffees. I think for me personally, it's really inspiring to see how much initiative uh, producing countries are taking in how they're developing new techniques in processing uh, and really looking to, I guess, solve some of the issues that they're seeing in how they're processing coffee. This gives us so much scope for how we do, I guess, what we do, whether that's roasting or brewing. Uh, and these three coffees have basically given us that massive scope to really go into fine-tuned detail about how we want to attack the roasting, how we want to attack the brewing, uh, to deliver the most delicious cup possible. Um, yeah, what's really cool, what we're seeing here is, I mean, these producers, they're connecting so much, the, um, more than they ever have. You know, they're, you go to expos around the world and you see like, and especially some of these Panama producers, you see a group of them, they're all mates, they're all talking, they're visiting each other's farm, they're sharing information, then they get, they've become so dialed in to their product and their coffee. And, you know, I didn't go for a year or so and then it's suddenly like, what? They're doing honeys in the ferments and they're, they've got, you know, Lost Origin guys measuring cells per, per milligram 
of inoculation and going, this is how many um, cells that I want for the inoculation to do with this. And I'm like, I don't even know, know where you're at with that. But that's, um, it's super inspiring from our end. And they've got an intentional idea of what they want to bring out of their coffees. And by having that connection, where I guess our goal is to sort of present their wish in, in what they've done in the processing. Um, so Danny is sort of pulling those levers of balance to try and make that as delicious as possible. And then we're considering in terms of brewing what Danny's done with it roast wise and also what's happening with, um, with the process as well. So you'll notice we haven't gone dramatically different in sort of brewing, but there's a few levers that are quite intentional like your brew temperature, slight adjustment and grind set. We're not like changing brew cones or like changing to immersion for one. We're not dramatically changing like how we're approaching it, but we're pulling intentional levers to just bring that coffee, tweak it into the spot that we want it. So um, yeah, we are, we are super, super proud um, to have such great partners at Origin. Project Origin as well, doing a lot of work with their producers, um, and also Sam doing a lot of sourcing himself. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of having that connection right through that really, this isn't a secret. The secret really is kind of having that broader vision, that broader scope, and making intentional choices so that you can actually experience it properly at the end. So yeah, um, yeah we'll open up to any questions and then Oh, so before we do that, oh, yeah. we're going to do a little poll. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we want to know what everyone's favorite coffee was from tonight. So if you can put your hands up, if the first coffee we tasted, the Lost Origin, was your favorite today? It's been different everywhere as yeah. well, which is kind of cool. Okay. Now, who liked the Abu, the second coffee? Yeah, okay. And the third coffee, the Mifinkita? Interesting, cool. Yeah, wow. So it's here, totally different today, to the other yeah, two. the Abu <laughs> seems to be the favorite, but uh, yeah, it's been, I think we've had three different favorites in three different cities, so it's really cool. Uh, they like the Lost Bris Origin Bris in Brisbane? Brisbane was, uh, Brisbane was uh, Finkita. Ah, uh, Finkita. And they stay in yeah. Sydney, the Lost Origin was the favorite, and yeah, Abu tonight. So it's real. Yeah, Obviously, different preferences for different people. Even this room, everyone's got their uh, own favorite. So it's really cool just to see this, you know, one variety of coffee from this one uh, country presented in different ways. And we get such a, like, a broad spectrum of, uh, of preferences and what people are enjoying. So one other really small note, actually, just to say, like, I do not want to say this while you're drinking it, but this coffee is just the tiniest little bit fresh in a few more days. So we've got boxes here. Uh, in a few more days, these coffees are going to be more explosive. They're going to be more like we're definitely happy with how they're expressing. But we've got brew guides on those boxes. So you can go online. We have actual proper windows of where we look at these coffees. So you can improve them a little bit more. Uh, if you were to take them to the suggested freezing date and then freeze it down, give it at least a week in the freezer, these coffees are going to improve. Um, so you have seen, you know, the possible peak here, you could start playing with cup size, shape, all that sort of stuff if you want to take it further. Uh, but we do have um, some extra boxes here if anybody wanted to take anything yummy home. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. If anyone has any questions or anything before we wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess some of the the inspiration around that is like i was mentioning before there's so much happening at origin with developments in terms of how the coffee's grown how it's processed at the same time like as roasters and i guess working in uh with baristas we know that customers also have an expectation of what their coffees should taste like and i guess that's a ingrained sense of balance they they can kind of know how strong they want their coffees to be the levels of acidity in body for us, we're trying to, I guess, walk that gap between uh, the two. So if we can convert and take all that uh, flavor profile and everything that's happened at Origin and transfer it in a familiar way to the end customer, I think that's when we know that we've done a really good job. Uh, we get to you know, tell the stories of Origin and share all the amazing things that are happening, but still deliver something uh, familiar and comforting for the uh, customer as well. Yeah. Push-pull helps. Any other questions? Yeah. Kind of like for you, Danny. Like, yeah. How do you think how this processing is affecting roasting and like do you think like what, what would like this like something like positive that you see here in will this processing affect your roasting in terms of like maybe like understanding, maybe 
maybe consistency or like if you see any like... Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a constantly developing thing. So uh, obviously I've had the chance to work really closely with Sam. He's who I learned to roast uh, off of. Uh, and I guess that, that long time spent working with him, roasting, cupping, tasting, we've uh, developed, I guess, a, an idea and a familiarity for what kind of coffees work in certain situations. Uh, a lot of this has been built, I guess, through competition as well. The idea of like knowing, okay, we want to serve this style of a espresso to a judge. How do we track every single stage back up the supply chain to deliver that one result? It's kind of having a processing method that fits the purpose. So this is a big question that we have all the time and we're all, always having conversations with Project Origin about this as well where, you know, they're, they're going from pr producer perspective as well and then we're coming from roaster beverage perspective. And this is something that Danny presented in his um, barista comp was the beverage focused framework. And it's your processing to suit that. But what's cool is you're seeing there's so much variety and we, we pick the things that we think are going to express nicely in that end. Um, sort of expression. So, um, yeah, the crazy processes make his job pretty hard. Yeah, they open up. There, I guess there's basically you can imagine them as kind of cogs or levers all the way down the supply chain, and you change one, and you need to change the other. But at the same time, you know, we can sometimes fix issues that we're having with how we're approaching roasting by doing something or sourcing slightly differently. So they're they're all, I guess, interlinked little cogs that work differently. So you just need to sort of understand the big picture and then understand how you can best pull the levers that, that you can uh, to deliver the best result at the end. What's kind of cool as well with processing is, you know, like say anaerobic processing started and it was like, let's just go crazy with everything and do everything and, um, because we're excited by it, right? And we had to navigate from like the effects of that. So you start pushing processing a lot and then that changes how a roast is going to behave and how a brew is going to behave. And then it took a number of years, like, you know, Sasha's really presented that in 2015 of that carbonic maceration sort of style, anaerobics have gone crazy. Uh, but then we're sort of like, it's, it's, I liken it to when we went way too light roasting um, for a bit and then, you know, we were too dark and then we were too light and then we're sort of starting to figure out where we sort of want to sit with things and we're starting to understand how it all behaves and then the areas we want to tweak within that. Producers are, at the same time are, they're starting to figure their areas out as well more and more, which is definitely helping. It's like more about details, it sort of feels like now. Like yeah. control, like intentional, directive results while still tinkering. Yeah, like it's, so it's like what you that. see really great chefs do. You know, you know, really great chefs are going to understand their product. They don't necessarily have to do too many things to it necessarily. They can put an amazing plate on the table. Like the really experienced chefs are doing less to their product. They're kind of leaving it alone and allowing it to speak. And they're going, nah, I'm going to nudge it that way a little bit or that way a little bit. When the young chefs are like, I'm going to throw every technique at my ingredient as I can. And then it can come out a little bit confused or inconsistent. So I feel like what's really lucky having that full broad picture with origin, with roasting, with um, brewing all linked, is where starting to go, no, no, we feel it's appropriate for it to be nudged up here, not down here. And that's helping us be a little bit more consistent and wasteless, which is definitely good. I could just keep rambling yeah. if anyone else has any more questions. Yeah, so we got to the, the end of the talk, and which coffee was your favorite? Hmm. Hmm. Look, Finkita has been my favorite for the first two, but I think Abu tonight yeah. is looking the best of all three. Yeah. Um, I liked, I just like that awesome acidity structure and the, the softer florals and that like really, really long, elegant, silky sort of profile. Yeah. I'm also looking forward to working more with the Lost Origin. So I believe it's on our next month's rotation for Reserve Espresso. So I'm really yeah, very true. excited to, yeah, get, to get stuck cool into espresso. that. So, um, yeah, so I think overall, yeah, the Abu has been really strong, but yeah. I don't know, it's, it's been different. The first up I was like Lost Origin only and then the other two, nah, I'm changing my mind. I think that shows the strength in the coffees, but I think we'll only be able to tell once they're at full age, they're fully opened up and then we'll be able to see. It's probably preference again then, yeah. right? 
Anyway, I guess we wanted to say thank you all for coming out on a weeknight. Uh, we'll be around for a little bit longer, so if you have any more questions or anything, you want to come say hello, we can answer questions about the coffees and stuff like that. But again, I just want to say thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you.